only connect. That was the whole of her sermon. Only connect the prose and the passion, and both will be exalted, and human love will be seen at its height. Live in fragments no longer. E. M. Foster, Howard's End, nineteen ten. Hello and welcome to this online talk to celebrate the life and work of the artist Joan Eardley in the centenary year of her birth. I'm Griffin Coe, art curator, and I would like to start with a short biography of the artist. Joan Eardley was born in Sussex in 1921 and brought up in London, but trained at Glasgow School of Art from 1940. After her training in Glasgow, she studied for six months at a residential art school, Hospital Field in Arbroath. There she met Angus Neil, a former soldier and joiner, who was three years her junior. A very significant friendship was formed between the two artists that lasted until Eardley's death in 1963. Both Angus and Joan were taught by James Cowey, who was the warden at that time at Hospital Field. Joan Eardley makes such a distinctive contribution to painting in Scotland that she is regarded as a Scottish painter. Her career was cut tragically short by breast cancer, and she died in 1963 at the age of 42. Her ashes were scattered on the beach at Catiline in Aberdeenshire. In this talk on the works of Joan Eardley, I shall be discussing the concept of the innocent eye, defined by the art historian John Ruskin. I will be arguing that Eardley's gift lies in the combination of charisma, simplicity, and directness. Which empower her to create a sense of contact with viewers in her portraiture and landscape paintings. Although she had an unbelievably shy disposition, her paintings are alive with energy and vitality. One reviewer in the newspaper wrote, quote, "Miss Eardley display a virility that few young male painters could match." There is also freshness and purity in her childlike observation of both the natural and physical world, without succumbing to any particular influence, tradition, or artistic style. In descriptions of Joan's works, the words intuition, simplicity, immediacy, and natural keep recurring. Her works have a timeless quality, and they have the ability to move us, because her vision was fully in tune with nature, and untainted by an academic vision or convention. She once wrote to an artist friend, quote, "And anyway, there's always what you paint, which should govern the way you paint, so that it doesn't really matter how you are taught." Thus, her art can be seen as part of a longer tradition, and continuous with Ruskin's notion of innocent vision. Ruskin believed that drawing is really the art of seeing. In 1857, he wrote *The Elements of Drawing*, published as a step-by-step -step manual, based on the drawing lessons he had given at the Working Men's College. In Red Lion Square, Holborn, where he taught alongside the Pre-Raphaelite painter Rossetti, Ruskin encouraged his students to go outside and observe nature. He wrote in his preface, quote, "I believe that the sight is a more important thing than the drawing, and I would rather teach drawing that my pupils may learn to love nature than teach." Looking at nature, that they may learn to draw. He came to believe that artistic skill acquired through innocence of the eye 
is fundamental to an artist's training. He wrote, The whole technical power of painting depends on our recovery of what may be called the innocence of the eye, that is to say, of a sort of childish perception of these flat stains of colour, merely as such, without consciousness of what they might signify, as a blind man would see them if suddenly gifted with sight. Ruskin's idea of the innocence of the eye might be viewed as an attempt to break free from the stereotypes, conventions, and accepted visions, in the hope that it would at least allow an artist to find his or her own visual language without becoming over-influenced by his past, training, or particular dogmatic creed. Joan's own view echoes Ruskin's teaching when she wrote about the old masters as follows, quote, There is no doubt in my mind that they are great painters, but their work is so individual, so much a style evolved for themselves, that one cannot copy their works, because in using their style, one gets left with that alone, and nature, or the idea which nature gives you, is forgotten. She also expressed the concept of the innocent eye when she said in a 1963 BBC interview, quote, And I suppose I am essentially a romantic. I believe in the sort of emotion that you get from what your eyes show you and what you feel about certain things. Well, I don't really know what I am painting. I'm just trying to paint. Although there is no mention from Erdley that she had read Ruskin's writings, it seemed very likely that his two books, The Elements of Drawing and The Elements of Perspective, would have been on the recommended reading list at the art school she attended. The court syllabus during her time at Glasgow was quite broad, and her art history was taught alongside practical art training including classes on perspective, modelling, anatomy, painting and composition. The guest speakers at the art school included the renowned art historians Thomas Botkin and Nicholas Pespiner, to name a few. At Glasgow School of Art, Early's drawing and painting teacher was Hugh Adam Crawford, Crawford was an inspiring teacher who was accommodating and open-minded when it came to his teaching. The art critic Cordelia Oliver said that he was, quote, the least didactic of teachers who encouraged his students to follow their artistic conscience even if the whole world was against them. His teaching style was unusual in the sense that for Crawford, painting is not merely an intellectual exercise, but it is also important for the students to learn, quote, to feel their painting in their bodies. There are a few live drawings from early student days in our collection. We are looking at a few examples of our drawings. As we can see, she already possessed a remarkable technical proficiency, draftsmanship, and quality of line. She had total control of the line, and yet it looks relaxed and flowing in the way she depicts the human form. A contemporary at the school during this period once described her at work during the live class. Quote, Slowly, the hand with chalk or charcoal would go to the paper, make now a single mark, now a flurry of lines with speed and certainty. Then again would come to the long frowning stare beneath the heavy fringe of hair, silent, storing up information, sorting out process and the quick delivery. 
She was the most objective, as well as by a long chalk, the best draughtsman in the school. These drawings fill out periods in her life as a young painter, which until now were little known. They reveal so much of Joan's approach to the visible world. The art critic John Berger wrote an essay on drawing in his book titled "Towards Reality: Essay in Seeing, 1962," with regard to the difference between looking at the painting and looking at the drawing for the spectator. He wrote, quote, "In front of a painting or statue, he, the spectator." Tends to identify himself with the subject, to interpret the images for their own sake. In front of a drawing, he identifies himself with the artist, using the image to gain the conscious experience of seeing, as though through the artist's own eye. In 1948, she won two scholarships to travel and work in Italy for eight months, from September 1948 to May 1949. She traveled backwards and forwards between Florence, Ravenna, and Venice. Her drawings in Venice, such as inside the Basilica of San Marco, show her awareness of Ruskin's work. And they can be seen in parallel with Ruskin's depiction of architectural details in one of his most famous works, *The Stone of Venice*, which was published in three volumes from 1851 to 53. Ruskin's book, *A Study of Venetian Art*. Architecture and history became the standard guide for the educated Victorian traveller. Henry James wrote in 1882, "Among the many strange things that have befallen Venice, she has had the good fortune to become the object of a passion to a man of splendid genius, who has made her his own, and in doing so has made her the world's." There is no better reading at Venice than Ruskin. As an avid reader of literature, Joan had read the French novelist Marcel Proust's novel title *In Search of Lost Time* in seven volumes. Proust also travelled to Venice with a copy of Ruskin's *The Stone of Venice*. It is no coincidence that Venice became the setting for some of Proust's most poetic writings and for many of his most penetrating insights in his novel. From looking at the details of Joan's drawings in Venice, one can only speculate that she probably went there with a copy of Ruskin, like so many others before her, as a guide. Her drawing seems to reflect a vision of Venice seen through Ruskin's eyes. Gothic and Byzantine architecture fascinated Ruskin. In the Gothic forms, every carving, stone, and ornamental detail is different and executed by hand. They show the individuality of the workman and the mark of his hand, as well as his imperfections. For Ruskin, it is spiritual and humane. It is in contrast with what he liked to call the rule-bound classical artist, Joan, who depicted individuals with distinctive personality in her work, would have been in ideological agreement and shared this view with Ruskin. During her trip, she seems to be enthralled by portraying strongly contoured figures of Italian men and women going about their daily routine, or praying in the church. Like Ruskin, Joan also had an admiration for the freshness of Carpaccio. Ruskin copied a cycle of Carpaccio's painting devoted to the subject of Saint Ursula. House in the Accademia Gallery in Venice, Ruskin particularly liked the look of Saint Ursula, because she reminded him of his beloved Rose Latouche. Another observation that Ruskin made was that, although Carpaccio painted historical scenes, the figures, architecture, and backgrounds were Venetian. 
The artist painted what he could see rather than what he imagined, a perfect example of the innocence of the eye, according to Ruskin. We can draw another parallel here with Joan's work, which is also based on reality. She painted what she saw, and therefore she never veered from depictions of the real world. She retained some forms of representation and never completely abandoned the real, in favour of pure abstraction. Her first Glasgow subjects were the street kids from the surrounding tenements, sitting on the curbs, playing on the pavements, or queuing up for the cinema. Each was brilliantly observed and recorded. Now I would like to focus on the period when Joan went to stay at Hospital Field in 1947, which was and is an art school for postgraduate art students in our growth. While she was there, the warden of Hospital Field was James Cowie, renowned for his hatred of expressionism or gestural freedom. It is perhaps unsurprising that he and Joan soon came to verbal blows over her painting. However, once they had come to terms with one another, he and the ambience of Hospital Field had much to offer the young artist. And this was also where she met her lifelong friend, the artist Angus Neal. We are looking at this painting by Joan from a private collection, which was done during her days at Hospital Field. The finished painting is a very rare example of her work from this period. The sketch is from our collection, which was one of the generous gifts from the artist's sister, Mrs. Pat Black. We can see how tightly worked the sketch is, with bow strokes and slashing lines, and how she allowed it to grow to a larger scale in a finished painting. Although the colours are slightly restrained, which owes something to the influence of Cowie at that time, she retained the vigorous and breezy effect in both her sketch and the finished painting. The idea of the innocent eye does not apply to Cowie's technique. He was, to use the words of one of his students, the artist Alberto Morocco, an analytical painter, and one of the best draftsmen of his generation. He was closely associated with North East Scotland. He was born and educated in Aberdeenshire and as head of painting at Grey School of Art in Aberdeen and warden of Hospital Field in Arbroath, he became an influential art educator in Scotland. Every work Cowie made is an outcome of careful and painstaking study, pursued through numerous drawings. Like a surgeon working in an operating theatre, everything has to be meticulous and scrutinised, even before one touches the canvas to put it all together. Morocco said that Cowie was, quote, a quiet and intellectual type, who wasn't a free painter, he was a type painter. His own particular idols were the early Flemish and French painters, and Quattrocento Italian painters as well, rather than the later High Renaissance stuff. Morocco was influenced by Cowie's style of drawing when he said, quote, I learned to draw in that very tight intellectual sort of way. It wasn't a free drawing, not a kind of Matisse thing with a free line happening. It was totally under control the whole time. We are looking at the painting titled Studio Interior by Cowie with a scene set in a studio at Hospital Field with four summer students in a live class. It has been suggested by Cowie's daughter that the figure sitting on the model's throne is Joan, who attended Hospital Field between April and September 1947. We can see one of our paintings, The Evening Star by Cowie, at the far right in the background. William Buchanan also suggested that the woman lying on the grass in this painting titled Noon by Cowie in our collection may have been Joan Erdley. 
However, he acknowledged that the the date of the painting, 1946, is out of sync with the date of Joan's study at Hospital Field in 1947. If we put the two paintings by Cowie and Joan side by side, we can see the startling difference in terms of style as well as mood in their paintings. Brother and Sister was executed in 1955. It depicts two young children in a city environment. Their clothes are ill-fitting hand-me-downs which cling awkwardly to their small bodies. Surrounding them are graffiti carved walls into which the boy and girl become subsumed as their man-made environment dictates their standard of living. It is a haunting image which combines the uncompromising painter's eye with a warm human sympathy, pathos and understanding. It reminds us of the line from the poem which is a meditation on Rembrandt's late self-portraits by Elizabeth Jennings. The sadness and the joy, to paints to breathe, and all the darknesses are dead. The elder brother, holding on to his sister's hand, is painterly protective of her hand. He shyly avoids eye contact with the viewer, yet his little sister is innocently confrontational. Early skill in depicting the heads is incredible. With bow handling, she conveys the roundness of the skull and the features of the child. She makes no attempt to disguise the physical reality of her subject. The little girl tousled and camped hair and raggedy clothes are all masterfully painted. Although Joan never had children of her own, her fondness for children shines throughout her work. Perhaps it was their innocence of the eye and how they see the world that was attractive to her as an artist. On the other hand, if we look at Two Schoolgirls by Cowie, we see a totally different picture. This is one of his most successful compositions. It has many preparatory drawings associated with it, revealing Cowie's painstaking method of picture making. He started this painting while he was teaching at Bells Hay Academy near Glasgow from 1915 to 1935. Cowie often used his classroom as his studio and would work alongside his pupils rather than teaching them, observing them closely whilst he did this. He was fascinated with them in much the same way as the children of Townhead in Glasgow were later to fascinate Joan Eardley. However, unlike Joan, Cowie's children are not full of liveliness and rough humour but are dreamlike and idealised. There is a quality of stillness in his painting. His favourite poet was William Wordsworth, and there is a line from Wordsworth's poem, The Excursion, which seems to describe the essence of Cowie's work. Quote, Central peace subsisting at the heart of endless agitation. Joan's work is rooted in reality. She felt at home amongst the people of Glasgow. She often used a pram to carry her paints and easel around the streets, looking for the new subject matter. She said, quote, I like the friendliness of the back streets. Life is at its most uninhibited here. In contrast, Cowie was more interested in surrealism and mythical subject matter. If we look at this painting, The Evening Star by Cowie, which is regarded as his masterpiece and done at Hospital Field, the composition is enigmatic and surreal. It is modernist interpretation of a painting by Turner that Ruskin wrote about in his fifth volume of Modern Painter. Turner's picture is called the goddess of discord choosing the apple of contention in the garden of the Hesperides. It was exhibited in 1806 and is now in the collection at Tate Britain. 
The female figures in this Cowie's painting represent the daughters of Hesperus, the evening star. But the setting of a cave in Cowie painting is inspired by Dixmont's Den near Arbroath. In the Stone of Venice, Ruskin identifies six characteristics in the nature of Gothic, and among them they included savageness, changefulness, and naturalism. In this final part of the talk, I will be exploring these three elements when looking at Joan's Catline seascapes. Ruskin identifies savageness as a quality of the architecture that originated in Northern Europe as opposed to the classical architecture in Southern and Eastern Europe. He explained, quote, like all art forms, it strives for perfection, but as it does so, it accepts its quest as part of life, and it therefore needs to absorb savageness in its resulting form. We can also apply the term savageness in terms of a way of seeing the natural world, its sublimity, rawness, and elemental violence, and the climate in which people in the north live. The second element of the Gothic, according to Ruskin, is changefulness. Ruskin believed that the quality of the Gothic contains this element because, quote, great art consists in its saying new and different things. A great work of art embodies this changefulness because it was not repetitive, or what he called, quote, merely a bold variation from the round, but it admitted of millions of variations of itself. The third element is naturalism because it sought in form and detail to portray nature in its most rugged and severe state. These three qualities defined by Ruskin are profoundly relevant when looking at Joan's seascapes of Catiline. It was at the Gaumont Cinema Gallery in Aberdeen that Joan's first exhibition was held in 1950, and on this trip she discovered Catiline, where she was to spend so much of her time from then on. The sea is a source of energy that can give life and that can also take it away. When we are looking at this painting, high tide a winter afternoon, we can experience savageness as Joan painted nature at its most challenging when the waves heaved and rolled and lashed under dark, lowering, menacing skies. She exposed herself to the harsh elements and mastered them by becoming at one with them. In extreme cold and biting winds, she clumped her painting boards to her easel, which she anchored at the foot with huge boulders. Her technique is broad and vigorous, with great freedom of handling. There is a hastiness in execution, and sometimes paint so fluid that it dribbles down the canvas. The distinctive curve of the Bay of Catiline is one of the artist's greatest motifs. The sea here is relatively calm, but always brooding with the dark wintry sky above. We can also see that she was looking at the landscape with an innocent eye, because her eyes were open to whatever weather or the wild, windswept and untamed elemental life of the sea threw at her and she tried to capture it in paint. The art critic in The Guardian, Eric Newton's review, echoes the notion of the innocent eye in Joan's work when he wrote that, quote, Like Turner, she paint as though the brush were an integral part of her personality. No slickness here, no tricks, no elegance. Just a trial and error attempt to convey the painterly's equivalent of what she so intensely wants to convey. When at Catiline, she painted the grey North Sea in winter. In the summer months, she turned her eyes inland to the pastures and the barley fields on the cliffs behind her cottage. 
I would like to leave you with this sketch by Angus Neil, which shows Joan sketching in the field and looking out to the blue sea in the distance. In conclusion, there can be little doubt that Joan's paintings possess an enduring quality. They will always have the ability to move us because they have those elements described in Ruskin's idea of the innocence of the eye that is evident in how she captured the fleeting motion of children playing in the street or changing colour of a stormy sky. It is no exaggeration that her innocent eye provided the raw material from which her timeless paintings were distilled. I will let Proust to have the last word at his description of the sea perfectly sum up why it became a vital source of inspiration for Joe. This passage comes from the collection of his early short stories titled Regrets, Reveries, Changing Skies. The sea refreshes our imagination because it does not make us think of human life. Yet it rejoices the soul, because like the soul, it is an infinite and impotent striving, a strength that is ceaselessly broken by falls, an eternal and exquisite lament. The sea thus enchants us like music, which, unlike language, never bears the traces of things, never tells us anything about human beings, but imitates the stirrings of the soul, sweeping up with the waves of those movements, plunging back with them, the heart thus forgets its own failures and finds solace in an intimate harmony between its own sadness and the sea's sadness, which merges the sea destiny with the destinies of all things.